Have you ever got that sinking feeling after reading an email from your phone or internet provider that you're a victim of a data breach that they just had? Well, today we're diving deep into a crucial topic that affects us all, protecting our personal information online. Now, I'm only making this video because I recently received an email from AT&T, and I'm not an AT&T customer and haven't been for years, but I got an email from them telling me that my personal information had been leaked. I've also been part of two data breaches that I know of that have happened to T-Mobile. And, you know, I like to share and inform and help people, so I'm just sharing what I do to protect my information. Protecting our personal information in today's digital world is crucial. So, today I'm sharing some essential tips so you can take these steps to safeguard your personal information and avoid potential financial losses due to data breaches. And then remember that the content on my channel is for educational purposes only, but as always, if you're here, you're interested, so let's get into it. Now, the weird thing is you're looking at the screen and you don't understand. Well, I'm going to share this website with you because this is one of my oldest emails. This is an email that I absolutely use for everything. And I wanted to see if it had been part of some sort of data breach. And oh my goodness, when I tell you the amount of information, so I'll scroll down and show you. This is breaches that I've been a part of and didn't even freaking know it. I knew about the AT&T one because they told me, but it's not entirely illegal for companies to not tell you. This is just some stuff, right? The funniest one that I seen, approximately in 2008, my MySpace. Wow, by the way. Zynga. This is the developer that made words with friends. And this one, it kind of hurt my heart because it's email addresses, passwords, phone numbers, and usernames. I like this site and I'm gonna share it with you a little bit later after I give you more information. Um, but because it tells you the information that they were able to get. So date of birth, email address, government issued IDs from AT&T, phone numbers, and physical addresses. So this is a huge problem. Before we get into the tips for you guys, listen, let's talk about how data breaches actually happen. One of the things that I've come to realize is that consumers can unknowingly contribute to data breaches. Until I started doing the research after the first T-Mobile breach that I was in, I didn't really realize that weak passwords, social engineering and phishing attacks, unsecured public Wi-Fi, and even malware from clicking on malicious links or downloading infected attachments can all lead to a company experiencing a huge data breach. I thought it was just our information. Customers don't know that, or at least I didn't know that. I didn't understand that there was a correlation before the two. So I'm definitely not saying that all data breaches only happen because of the consumer side of things, because it's important to note that data breaches can also happen due to factors entirely outside of consumer's control. Um, from the company side, data breaches can occur when a company has outdated security systems, inadequate employee training, accidental data exposure by an employee connecting to something like public Wi-Fi, and in rare cases, a physical breach where a hacker gets into the building and they can get to a server directly and steals the information. It takes organizations on average 204 days to identify a data breach and around 73 additional days to contain that breach. That doesn't include the amount of time that they can wait before notifying the consumers that a data breach has occurred. So I can completely understand how governments are strict with government employees and their families as far as what apps they can and can't have on their phones and devices. As crazy as this economy is in the US right now, I can completely see people using access to public Wi-Fi so that they can save money on their data plans. But I can also see how that along with different apps and things like that, that access data and information on your phone can be a significant security risk. But now that we've covered the, the how, 
let's get into some of the steps that you can take to safeguard your personal information if you've been part of a data breach. So the first thing you want to do if you've been notified that you've been part of a breach is reset and strengthen your passwords as well as enable two-factor authentication if it's available, okay? If two-factor is available, you should be using it. Now, if you've been part of a data breach, assume that all of your information that's connected to that website has been leaked because they don't actually tell you everything. They don't give you all the details. So one of the things that I want you to remember for this first step is that you don't need to memorize your passwords. You need to write them down. So you can get something like a password book. I have this little book that I use. It has little alphabetical tabs in it. Um, and I like it, like see? tabs um we actually have way more passwords than we think i have 313 when i started like putting mine in the book oh my goodness when i started taking them off my browser and putting them in this book it was crazy 313 but the next part of the first step is to make sure that you're using strong and unique passwords for each of your online accounts and i hear you saying but chrissy it's so hard to remember tough passwords but remember, your job is not to memorize the passwords, it's to write them down, okay? I'm not gonna dive deep into the mistakes that people make when they're making passwords, um, cause we should be past that as much. Well, you know what? Just in case you're new here to the channel, welcome, hi, glad you're here, nice to meet you. Um, I have a document that you can grab that dives deep into online security for you. I show you how I create strong passwords that are actually easy to remember if they're funny. Um, but I show you all of those tips. I've even done a video on using password managers with some safe options to use. And we all know to enable two-factor authentication, okay? Um, but just in case you forgot, I'm telling you again, two-factor authentication is a secondary defense to protecting your account. Just in case somebody gets access to your username and password, the second step before actually logging in is putting in that two-factor authentication code. So sometimes that can be the difference between your information being accessed by a hacker or the difference between them moving on because they can't get in. It does take a few extra seconds to log in, but it's definitely worth it. Now, moving on to step number two. The second thing you should do if you're a part of a breach, I want you to take a quick inventory. What I mean is what email address was connected. Were there any credit or debit cards or bank accounts connected to the breached account? Is your address, telephone number, or any other personal information like your date of birth connected to the breached account? Having this information is going to help you know what you need to update. If you know your email address was part of the breached information, you now know you have an additional password to reset, right? So to give you an example of what I mean, I know that my AT&T account information was breached. I know what email address and password is associated with that account. So I'm going to reset that information. Because I know the email address is associated with the account, I'm gonna also reset that password too. If you know what credit or debit cards were connected to the account, you know what financial institutions you need to contact to order new credit or debit cards. If your address or phone numbers were leaked, you know to look out for spam in the mail, on your phone, in the form of written letters, text messages, or phone calls. Be leery of phishing and social engineering attempts because you should be cautious after you've been notified of the breach of any emails, text messages, or phone calls claiming to be from legitimate organizations related to the breach. Scammers may try to exploit the situation to trick you into revealing even more information, okay? So remember, financial institutions, banks, most companies don't call you and ask you for, for any type of information. They're not gonna call you. They're gonna send you something and tell you to call. A way that you can stay safe is to just make the phone call yourself. If you get a call or something, just call yourself. 
I was part of an identity theft thing involving Wells Fargo. I've never had Wells Fargo, but some of my information was leaked from the T-Mobile breach and used over at Wells Fargo. But I got a letter in the mail from them in an email. So instead of responding to the letter in the mail or the email, what I did was I looked up their customer service number and I called them directly to let them know that I got a letter and I got an email. They sent me over to their fraud department. Oddly enough, it was a pleasant experience, right? It was really easy and they helped me. And they said it was really good because I didn't interact with the stuff that the scammer sent me. So keep that in mind too. The third step you're going to want to take if your information has been part of a breach is to contact the credit bureaus and freeze your credit reports. You can also place a fraud alert on your credit reports with the major credit bureau. So Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. You can call them and put a fraud alert on your information. This is going to tell them to take extra steps to verify your identity before they extend any types of lines of credit or if there are any major purchases or anything like that that are going to be made that require an additional line of credit. So make sure to reach out to all three credit bureaus if you're outside of the United States. I don't know what your equivalent of this is going to be, so drop it in the comments for me because I'd like to help everybody in the community. And I know that there are lots of you outside of the U.S. in the community, so drop that in the comments section for me. Okay, thanks in advance. But consider placing a credit freeze on your credit report too to prevent any unauthorized access that just stops anything from happening that requires credit to be used so nobody's going to be able to go buy a car or a house in your name because you've put that freeze on there okay so if you're not going to be making any major purchases put a freeze on your credit report so that no transactions or no credit can be extended to you this makes it more difficult for identity thieves to open up new accounts in your name. Since we are taking inventory, when you know what email address is associated with the account that has had the breach, I want you to go to this website. I do suggest doing it from a secure browser, from a private browser, and looking up the information. This website is haveibeenpwned.com just like it says right here. Um, you're gonna put the email address that's associated with the breached account in here. This is my email address that I use for junk email, um, but this is one of the oldest email addresses that I have. And this is the one that is associated with the account that I used to have with at and So I put it in here and sure enough, what it does is it gives you a list of everything that has been breached based on the email address that you provided. So March, 2024, tens of millions of records allegedly breached from at and right? But it tells you down here, date of birth, email address, government issue IDs, names, phone numbers, physical addresses. This is a lot of personal information. This is basically you still in my wallet with the exception of them getting credit card information, right? Um, but this lets you know what other websites you might need to change your login information for. One of the saddest ones that I found in this list was Zegna. This is the company that that made words with friends. Email addresses, passwords, phone numbers, and usernames. It's not bad because you can update all of those things, but definitely um, sad. So I wanted to share this website with you guys because this is gonna be part of your take inventory process. If you know that that email address that has been breached is associated with any other logins that you might have on any other websites, you might want to preemptively update the passwords for all of those as well. How many companies so far in 2024 have had data breaches occur? Well, because of me being part of a data breach, I wanted to do a little bit of research before I did this video, and I found out that so far this year, and today is the 26th of April, so far this year, there have been 1,819 publicly disclosed incidents. And it's extremely important for you to remember the publicly disclosed part, because again, companies aren't always letting people know that this has happened. But let's start with January. 
There's a company called Trillo who suffered a security breach affecting over 15 million users. Hackers were able to collect email addresses and usernames. Um, in February, Bank of America has not yet revealed how many users were affected by the data breach. However, a letter filed with the Attorney General of Maine disclosed that 58,028 individuals were impacted. Also in February, Change Healthcare had six terabytes of data breached. Six terabytes, that's a lot of information. Um, in March, Roku says hackers gained access to users' accounts through stolen login credentials. 576,000 accounts were breached in that cyber attack from Roku. In April, AT&T's breach, the one that I got the email for, the one that inspired this video. AT&T breach impacted 73 million current and former AT&T customers. And remember, I am not a current AT&T customer. I was affected, they sent me an email. So far, 2024 has had a massive data leak exposing 26 billion records across 3,800 folders, each corresponding to a separate data breach. That's around 12 terabytes of data from sites including Twitter or X now, LinkedIn, Dropbox, Canva, MySpace, Adult Friend Finder, Adobe, MyFitnessPal, and a bunch more. Some researchers and reporters are saying that this is the largest data breach ever. Some reporters are saying that this is the largest ever compilation of multiple breaches. The database also contains records from various government organizations, including those from the United States, which is a huge concern. Feel free to chime in. Just make sure that you're um, conscious of how you word things in my comments. And then that's just, that's a very nice way of me saying, watch your mouth, okay? But I am very concerned when banning TikTok is a bigger concern than putting things in place to prevent consumer data from leaking from other places that we as consumers use on a regular basis, okay? If you use Canva, if you're a creator, you're using that platform frequently, right? And it's, it's, it's not a lot, of, a lot of your personal information on Canva, but if you pay for the subscription, you have credit card information that could be on there. Your ID information, your address information could be on there because of you using your credit card. Those are things to be concerned about. As opposed to the app that kids dance on, and that's just what people in the news are calling it. But instead of focusing on that, we got other problems because this is 26 billion records, 3,800 different breaches, government organizations. This is the biggest breach in history and it's only April. Those are my two cents. Okay, so let's hop on the screen really quick. This is my asset and information protection guide. This is from my cryptocurrency craft course. If you guys don't know about it, it's in the link in my bio. But I want to show you this. This is from lesson number 15. I want to give you some tips because I recently updated this document for my students because of this AT&T breach situation. So let's go to page 10 and let me show you some bonus information. So this is step number four. The rest of the steps in this video are going to be extra bonus things that you could do because you've done the important parts um, outside of just, like I said earlier, contacting credit and debit cards and getting new cards and stuff like that. These, the rest of these tips are bonuses, but consider creating an online pseudonym or dummy identity for you to use online to protect yourself and your information. And that looks like creating a username that doesn't reveal any of your real or personal information. This one is a little bit tricky because you don't want to use like your pet's name. You don't want to use your favorite color or anything like that. If you have members of the family, like great greats and things like that, where you could use their middle names, or you could just use like, now listen closely when I say this, you can go to the website LastPass and you can use their random username generator tool. You can use something like this 
If you are writing down your usernames and passwords, this is a good way to go, okay? I'm, listen, don't yell at me, okay? I hear y'all over there yelling at the screen, shaking the phone and stuff. You can use this if you're going to be writing things down. I highly recommend using a random username generator for anything dealing with your money. I don't want you to use like your your name at your bank's website. That's what I mean. I don't mean you have to do this for everything, but this is a suggestion, okay? But back to the document. Create a unique username that doesn't reveal any of your real name or real personal information. You could use um, a combination of random words or like a combination of a nickname and a random word or a color or whatever. Next, use a separate email address for your dummy identity. So if you're creating a dummy identity, you would also create a dummy identity email. When I say create a dummy identity, I mean basically create an entire fictitious character. What's their name? When is their birthday? What is their phone number? All of that information I want you to choose. So if let's 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 build one for this video. So we're we're gonna take advantage of some post-it notes here. Let's go to our random username generator. Go watch my video on alternatives and things like that that you can use to save your passwords. I do not use this. I use a password book. If you would like to get the same book I got, it's like $4. I'll drop the link for you guys. Um, and I do also use an online version of this. But in order for you to find out which one I actually use, you need to watch this video. Look up there. Yeah, that video. Okay, but don't do that. So let's go back to our little account over here that we're creating. So our username is going to be whatever that is. And let's say that we're going to create a separate email address. And that's going to be this at protonmail.com. Let's get into the fun part. You can create, um, let, let's do the password since it's on a sheet. Password is going to be password is going to be compromised amazing parrot from this document now We're on page 15 if you want this document. It's in the link in my bio Okay, so now we have our username email address and our unique password that is very strong this document There's also something that I show you how to Determine how long it would take a hacker using software to crack your password This one is like a couple billion years or whatever so, like I said, if you want this document, in the link. Um, but avoid using real photos or profile pictures. Instead, you can use graphic images. I would suggest using some of the AI tools. A lot of stuff you could do for free. Type in a prompt. And when I say a prompt, I mean like blue sky with red roses and wild animals everywhere. 3D art render and then have it generate an image for you. Let's just use Canva for free really quick. Awesome, so we have created our profile picture. It's actually kind of pretty. Okay, so we've covered number four, avoid using real photos, done. Now, be careful with the information that you share on your profile, like your phone numbers, addresses, and stuff like that. What I want you to consider is to get a Google Voice phone number or some sort of voice over IP or VoIP phone number that you can use as a throwaway number. You want to use it as a number that you can get rid of if you want to and update it to something else, but you can actually send and receive phone calls on it. So Google Voice, Google Voice is an app or service that you can use to create phone numbers and send and receive telephone calls on your phone and devices. Um, this is free for you with Google service. So if you have a Gmail account, you just use it to log in. You can create a Gmail account based on the dummy information that we used and create a phone number for it. So now you can actually post this online if you are filling out surveys or if you want to attach a telephone number for um, two-step verification to your social medias and things like that. You can use a Google Voice number to do it. Just remember to write down everything that you attach to this telephone number just in case you change it to a new one. So you would know what things to log into to update. But this is free for you. Only people who are blood related to me, family, 
um, and very, very close friends. And, and I mean, like people who I've high five, touched, went to college with and things like that, um, have my actual telephone number. What I do suggest for like your dummy profile's birthday is to go ahead and pick a number, like whatever month your birthday is in. And I suggest picking the first day or the last day of that month. You could use your actual birth year because you're not actually using your birthday. My dummy identity's birthday would be 9184. Now, remember with this dummy identity, the address situation is tricky. I need you to remember that when you create this dummy identity, you might need more than one because it needs to be put together so that you don't receive, like you're using this in places where you're not going to receive physical mail, you're not going to get any phone calls, and you're not going to be required to do any type of KYC or know your customer where you use your ID to verify your identity. So this dummy account is not for things that require those three items, okay? If you do want to attach a address to it and you are able to get something like a P.O. box, you can definitely add that for the address part. So for number six, consider using a VPN or virtual private network to mask your IP address and your location. This is tricky because if you're using free VPNs, free VPNs are not all they're cracked up to be. They do not secure your information as much as you think they would. And some of them have been known to sell your information. So if you do want to use something like a VPN, I definitely suggest going to proton.me and checking out the products that they have. The VPN that Proton offers is paid. You can do a monthly or yearly plan and they even have an additional discounted plan that's for two years. VPNs aren't a thousand percent necessary and they're not really for everybody so that is a suggestion of one that I do trust. If you do decide to create a dummy identity but you would still like to receive payments and make transactions under your dummy identity, I want you guys to think about using a pseudonym or alias and I personally do this. When money changes hands, all of my personal information is not exactly what shows up on the invoice. So consider that. Okay, that was step four. I wanted to hop back on camera here. Let's move on to step five. You want to go ahead and scan for malware and run any antivirus protection programs that you have on all of your devices. You wanna check for malware or any type of malicious software that may have been added or installed without your knowledge. When they get access, when hackers get access to your information, it's no telling what they can actually do with it. So this is an extra step to take to protect yourself, okay? We know that there's no extent that they won't go to to scam people, so you know, if you have the ability to do virus scan on your devices, go ahead and do that. I do suggest using DuckDuckGo as your browser on your different devices because there's a lot of different benefits to using that. Um, I'm pretty sure I've covered that in a video before. Um, hopefully in this video, if I didn't, we'll figure that out and I'll create a video with those benefits in it because it's a really good service to use and it's free. Um, but next, and this is our last tip for today, tip number six, I want you to keep detailed records of any communications related to the data breach, including emails, letters, and phone calls. This documentation may be helpful for restoring or repairing any issues that might come up. So I need you to stay informed about the breach, any updates from the business that was affected, follow whatever guidance they're giving you in how to protect yourself, and make sure that you're taking all of the steps to address the information. I know AT&T is providing some identity theft protection um, services for free for a year as a result if you are affected by the breach. So you wanna take advantage of stuff like that, but you also wanna keep record of it um, to just to make sure, just in case things do get out of hand, because you are able to hold companies responsible for their negligence, and that's to put it in a nice way. Now, inside of the community tab, I have dropped a poll for you because I would love to know how many people in the community have been part of a data breach. I put that information in the link in the description too. I've also put a complete list of like the resources and things that I've used, the documents that are available for you, um, the video that's up here. 
so that you guys can have access to that information too. Just in case you want to grab that, you'll be able to. It's right there. Um, at the end of the day, and I want to be nice, while consumers can unknowingly contribute to data breaches through a bunch of different actions that they could take, the ultimate responsibility for data security is with the companies themselves that we as consumers are giving their, our information to. They need to implement stronger and more robust security measures. They need to educate their employees and stay very vigilant against cyber threats. They're not going anywhere. They're just going to get worse. Hackers are conniving and clever, and that's the problem. At the end of the day, it's their responsibility to protect their consumers, to protect our information that we're giving them. It's our responsibility to make sure that we're not giving them too much and we're protecting ourselves. If you are in a breach, this is to cover all of the steps that I've personally taken, um, the things that I, I've personally had to do. You know what? Let me give you a bonus tip really quick. Here's my bonus tip for you guys. I do use multiple email addresses also for different things. They're categorized for me. I have one specific email address for banking, creditor debit cards, like just financial stuff outside of crypto, right? My crypto investments are in a separate email address. Um, and that's because the crypto world is crazy with the amount of information that we consume to make sure that our assets are moving along, if there are any updates and different things like that. So there's a dedicated crypto email that's not connected to my financial institution stuff. I do try to make sure to categorize things. There's a specific email for business that's not money related. There's one for subscriptions and newsletters that I subscribe to, um, services like Netflix and stuff. There's one for my social media. There's one specifically for family stuff, like pictures and things like that. Um, our family reunions, just communications and stuff like that from family. I do also have one for, um, like, you know how there's warranties on all your appliances and everything? I have an email address for that, too. Um, so you can categorize, or at least I categorize, um, different emails. And the reason I do that is because there's a huge benefit to it. And I didn't think about telling y'all this earlier until I was reporting now. So the reason why this is beneficial is because, for instance, for me, my AT&T, my old AT&T account, that information was breached. If they got access to the subscription email that that would be attached to, they would not have access to my email address that's associated with banking or social media or family stuff. They would only get access to what's associated with that email address. And that's just for subscription stuff. So categorizing things helps to benefit you because if a breach occurs, you kind of know everything that you would need to update. I don't need to update everything. I only need to update the stuff that's in that email address. And I know y'all are like, Chrissy, be for real. How am I supposed to check 50 emails? I don't even check the one I have. Trust me, I understand. I don't either. I only check those emails when I need to. I only pay my cell phone bill once a month. I don't care about like the promotions and stuff like that that are going on. If I if I do so choose to log in and check one of those emails, I will. There is very specific stuff that I need to check for crypto, but I set the alerts on my phone so I know to go check that email because something is supposed to be happening soon and there should be an update, blah, blah, blah. I don't log into the email with the stuff in it for my warranties until I need to access the information for one of the warranties. So compartmentalizing stuff helps you not have or feel inundated with emails too. Um, nobody checks all of that. Nobody reads on. Listen, I only check some of that stuff once in a while. My family don't send me emails. We have family reunions once a year. They send text messages. Uh, but now you see why. Um, additional bonus tip, make sure that you have a family password. And what I mean is something that you don't send through text, email, or don't you don't send it out digitally. This is something that you and your family sit down and you talk about. And this is this is a more serious one. I should put this earlier. But there is something going on on the internet where they hackers are creating AI versions of people. And they're using the AI version to reach out to that person's friends and family. 
my government name is nowhere to be seen on the internet okay um so you can't reach out to my friends and family and say chrissy said anything they know that this net i only use chrissy online i my family nickname ain't none of y'all business okay but they know if something is going on with me or my son or just i need help somebody need help i'm going to call them i might actually hop on facebook and video chat with them and we're going to use that safe word that password for the family before any money changes hands um one of my godsons his page was hacked and they reached out saying hey god mom is i'm I'm really in a bind i don't get paid for a couple weeks can you send me xyz i was like okay sure do me a favor and go to auntie such and such house and call me from her home phone when you get off work right exactly nothing happened because it was a scammer pretending to be my god baby okay so just even stuff like that like don't fall for it there was a couple online where their son had an ai bot made of him and the ai bot reached out to the granny and was saying he was in a bad car accident he was in jail his nose was broke all this crazy stuff and the granny was about to put up 10k to get her baby out of jail and all this stuff and the family was like the parents were like well first of all the mom she was like i do everything for my babies they would call me first and the granny was like you know what you're right they would and they started like talking through that situation and ended up calling him and he's like no i'm at the house with my girlfriend i'm fine so they used an ai version of him to call his granny to try to scam his granny out of 10k so it's important to to take into consideration the fact that you might need a family password too okay I know y'all are about to get out of here before I forget so that you can get access to the documents and stuff that I talked about. You can go to my YouTube or my Instagram. Click on the link that says info.chrissypips.com. Right? You can, it's going to take you to this page right here. You can scroll past these unless, of course, you want to download the free guide or join the community. Um, Don't forget to subscribe. But scroll down. And this is where you can suggest guides for me to build out for you. You can grab the guides from this video. So asset and information protection guide, the ultimate guide to strong and secure passwords, the crypto scam awareness guide, and secure your social media. All of these guides are here. They're not always here. So if you're watching this video at a later date and you do want access to this, please reach out to me and let me know. Depending upon when you're reaching out, the price may not be the same, but go ahead and reach out and I'll help you out. I did want to show you this so you know where to actually get the documents and everything that I talked about in this video. This card up here is going to link you to the other video that I was talking about that I did for the password protection thingies. Um, Go ahead and watch that. It was fun to make too. But listen, as always... Hopefully, this is informative and helpful. I do apologize that I've not been um, posting content consistently. I do not like to post content where it's not necessary. I don't like to post just for the sake of posting. Um, Not on this platform. Not where I want to educate and actually help you guys. If you want to see more of me, go over to TikTok. I post stuff over there way too frequently. Way too frequently. Um, and it's typically funny stuff, but I don't like to post stuff without having a reason to post something to provide value to my community. So I do apologize. Um, I do want to get back to posting regularly. I have some videos coming up for you guys about Fibonacci. So look out for those. I think I'm going to do three different videos to break down some of the tools for you and how you use them because my team and I, you know, we've been trading. I don't like trading for no, I mean, posting videos for no reason on this platform. If y'all want to see more of me, go to Instagram, go to TikTok. I'm usually on TikTok because it's really fun over there. As always, I hope you guys are having an absolutely amazing morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye. (laughs) This is a really long video. I didn't want it to be this long. But it was a lot of stuff to cover. If you guys have any questions,